Oh, guys. Amen. There we go. Now I'm on, right? All righty. Well, good morning. We want to welcome you today. We're glad that you're here. Those of you that are watching online this morning, let me welcome you as well. Um, let me share a couple of things before we jump into our message. If you want to go ahead and find Psalms 51 with me this morning, that's where we're going to be. Um, many of you wondered why last Sunday we did not have a Jinx helmet out here when you walked in. And uh, let me kind of share with you what took place. Uh, uh, it wasn't because we didn't try. Uh, the staff called. Coaches said that, sure, you can use it. Uh, but come to find out that the school doesn't actually own the helmet. It's owned by the Booster Club. And the helmet apparently is getting in bad shape. And the Booster Club was a little leery and scared to let it out because the football season just getting started. And uh, so they uh, said no because of that. And uh, they probably need to get a new one. Uh, but Stacy. Our superintendent called me, she, is, she found out about it, and just was so sorry that uh, we were not able to have that helmet out here for our people to walk through. But um, anyway, that's what happened, and that's why there was not a Jinx helmet when you walked in, and there was a big speed, and there was a metro. So, uh, but, you know, praise the Lord, amen. We had a great day, and uh, so I told him, I said, hey, find out what one of those things costs, and we might help you a little bit. You know, you never know. So anyway, uh, so excited to have the relationship that we have with Jinx School System, and uh, we get to do so many things, they allow us to do so many things, and we love that partnership that we have. This morning, though, as I said, I want you to take God's word and turn, if you will, to Psalms 51. And today's message, I've titled it simply Restoring the Heart of Ministry. And the reason why is all of us deal with sin. Every one of us. Sometime in another life, we're dealing with sin. It may be our thought life, it may be because we made bad choices, but all of us deal with sin. Uh, this week, I actually had three phone calls from three individuals that said, Pastor, uh, I, I've, I've, I, I sinned years ago, or I, something happened, or this recently took place, and I'm just really dealing with guilt, and I, I just don't know what to do. And I was praying about what God wanted me to share this morning, and the reason why we're kind of in some standalone sermons, when, I, when we uh, come back after Labor Day weekend, we're going to begin a brand new series out of the book of Titus. So some of you may have to go try to find that little book. It's kind of edged in there, about three chapters long. But such an encouragement, such a powerful book that we're going to be looking at. And we'll do that uh, the Sunday following Labor Day weekend. But as I, God took me back to Psalms 51. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture because in it, David, who was a man that was literally after God's own heart, we know that David sinned. In this passage of Scripture, uh, when Nathan had confronted him, about his sin. David writes this somewhere probably about a year, year and a half after all this had taken place. But what we find in this incredible psalm, and if you've never sat down and really read Psalms 51, I would encourage you to do that this afternoon. Uh, just go back, read it, and, and let it soak in because there is unbelievable truth. What David does in this psalm, he teaches us literally how to handle, don't miss this, how to handle sin and the right response through his response. And there are two things that he shows us to do. Number one, David says that when you sin, you've got to look at your sin. Now let me just read the first six verses for you. And we're not going to read the whole psalm. We're going to kind of take this apart. David writes and he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. I love the fact that he took responsibility. Didn't blame anybody else. Didn't try to pass it off on anybody else. I have sinned and I've sinned against you. And notice what he says. He's against you and only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom, he says, in the secret heart. I love the way that as David begins and he, as he approaches this, David basically tells us, listen, you've you got to come face to face with the reality of your sin. In other words, you don't hide it. You don't take this sin and, and put it aside. You don't try to manage it. You don't sweep it under the carpet. He says, you don't tell half truths. You don't cover it up. You literally have to rivet your gaze upon that sin. And I think for a lot of us, sometimes when we sin, we just rather kind of push it aside, cover it up, hide it, 
Pretend that it never took place. By the way, when you look at this text, David tells us that the cornerstone of genuine repentance, don't miss this, is emotion. One of the things that I discovered is that in biblical repentance, you cannot set apart our emotions. Sit down and read Psalms 51. When you do, you're going to discover this well of emotion coming out of David's heart. David says, I know that my sin is ever before you. I, I, I pray that you don't withdraw your spirit from me. You, you see this emotion. And what I want you to notice is there are three things that we have to feel out of this emotion when we do sin. Number one, we've got to feel guilt, and that's okay. We'll talk about that. We've got to feel the dirt, the grind in which sin is caused within our life, and we also have to feel the sorrow. In other words, there cannot be true, genuine, biblical repentance unless we feel the guilt and we sense and feel the dirt and the sorrow. Go back and look at verse one for a moment. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression. If you know anything about this story, we know that Nathan comes in and begins to talk to David and begins to tell David this story. Now, what you find is that David has this inherent plea for mercy. It's an appeal for God's compassion. He doesn't deny that he's guilty. He acknowledges that guilt. But what David longed for is God's mercy. When you think about sin in your life, I, I realize and realize in my own life that what we need and what David needed was not just simply another good reason as to why he did it. David didn't need to under, try, to, try to justify, if you will. He knew that he needed mercy. He needed that loving kindness. In a sense, what David is saying is, God, I don't have a leg to stand on. I can't justify it. I can't pass it off on anybody else. What I did was wrong. It was sin. But it is acknowledgement. Listen to me. It's an acknowledgement. In a sense, God, I really don't deserve your forgiveness. I really deserve your judgment. Verse 1, that's exactly what he's telling us. You see, the response to the story of Nathan, that Nathan gives to him probably about a year, year and a half, somewhere after he had committed the sin, had Uriah killed, time had gone by. Nathan came in and out of the king's palace. You can almost imagine that as, as Nathan would come in and out of the palace, David would probably see him and say, hey, Nathan, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great. Hey, David, do you have just a few minutes because I want to tell you a story. And if you know this story, Nathan looks at King David and he says, let me tell you a story. There was a, a wealthy sheep herder. He just had literally just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sheep. But, but you know what, David, there was a poor man that was his neighbor. He had one little sheep. It was his pet. One day, the wealthy man had a lot of guests that came in. And so he needed to feed his guests. And rather than going out and taking one of the sheep out of his own herd, which he probably would have never missed, he goes next door and he actually takes the one little lamb of this poor family. Imagine if you and I could be there and see this because the Bible depicts how David, David was mad. He wanted justice. And David actually says, he's, I'm going to make this man pay fourfold. He should have never done that. And I can just imagine as Nathan told that story and he looks into the heart and the face and the eyes of King David, he said, David, thou art the man. Now, I don't know about you, but I had a feeling that would just sense this melting. Oh, my gosh. What I do love about the story is that David didn't try to pass off the guilt to somebody else. He didn't try to hide it. David acknowledged it. David himself felt and sensed the responsibility and the guilt because he saw his sin for what it was. Secondly, you've also got to see the dirt or what I might call the grime. I want you to notice the figurative verbs that David uses in the first part of verse 1 and verse 2. He says, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. When you look at these, they describe, in a sense, this feeling of the grime and the dirt that was in his heart, and notice what he says, first of all, blotted out. He has this idea, I think, this, this sense of, of that 
is there any way that this human record can totally be erased? Can it be eradicated? Because I got a mark on my record. I need it taken care of. The second verb that he uses, he says, wash me. It's comparing forgiveness perhaps with the washing of clothes. My garments are stained. There is this sense in where I understand it. It's like, have you ever got something on your shirt and man, every time you look down, it's there and you can't get rid of it? And that's exactly the way he felt. I don't have clean garments. And the last one, he says, cleanse me. David had this idea of the priest as he would take and confess, if you remember, the sins of the nation of Israel. And, and if you may recall that, that and again, he was, I, I'm not usable. I need to be cleansed. And thirdly, it was to feel the sorrow. There is so much teaching on repentance in Scripture, and I think one of the reasons why is because God knew that we all had to do with sin. We were going to have to continue to do with sin until the day that you and I go home to be with him. But I want you to understand that if, if you take the emotions out of repentance, it's not biblical. You see, sorrow is that key that unlocks the door of forgiveness. And you can never have genuine, genuine repentance. Listen to me. Until you feel and sense the pain and the sorrow and the brokenness that that sin has caused. Look at verse 16. Just drop down for a moment and listen to what, what he says. He says, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. What God desires from all of us in those moments of when we confess sin and deal with sin is that broken, contrite heart. David took ownership of his sin. He recognized that. He says, you're not pleased with a burnt offering. I could give a burnt offering all day long. I've got plenty that I could sacrifice, but that's not what you desire. You desire that brokenness, that humility. Now, let me tell you, there is a difference between brokenness and guilt. There is what we call false guilt. As I said this past week, I had three actually conversations. One in particular was a lady that came to me and she sat down with me and she said, Pastor, she said, I, I made mistakes years ago when I was young and, and I, I dealt with it. I, I asked God to forgive me and I know that God has, but I'm still dealing with this guilt. She says, I feel like, Rick, that that every time I turn around, when I start trying to do something for the glory of God, or I try to get back into service in some way, all of a sudden, it's like Satan throws this in front of my face that you're awful and that you're, you're not worthy and you can't be used. And I looked at her and I said, let me ask you a question. Have you genuinely confessed? The word confess simply means to agree with God. I'm not calling it anything but sin. And that sin was against you. And I'm broken over that sin. I said, have you confessed it? Have you acknowledged it? Have you, have you gone to the Lord? She said, absolutely. I said, then let me ask you this question. I said, have you created a, a, a pattern of habit within your life that pushes you in walking in the light and staying in God's truth and building a wall so that you, you understand that you have put in the right things that keeps you from ever doing that again? She said, absolutely. I said, you need to stand up and look eyeball to eyeball and toe to toe with the devil and tell him he's a liar because that's false guilt. Listen to me. If you have confessed and genuinely repented and broken over that sin, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who in Christ Jesus. Hear me this morning. If you have confessed that sin, dealt with that sin, repented of that sin, according to this precious book, that sin is under the blood of the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. It is covered. However, there is still that sense of godly sorrow. There is a difference between, again, guilt and sorrow. I don't want you to live in the... He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. But the question is, is there that godly sorrow? You say, well, why is that so important? Not sorrow that that you can't manage it. Not sorrow that you're fearful that somebody's going to find out. I'm not talking about that. Or that your reputation might be hurt. It's interesting when you look at the Old and the New Testament, there's a big difference. For instance, in the Old Testament, the priest would announce that you were forgiven. And on the Day of Atonement, you may recall that they would take a lamb... And they would sacrifice that lamb. And they would take 
uh, another one and, and actually confess the sins of it and drive it through the city. And the priest would declare that your sins were covered. Well, I got great news for you in the New Testament. In the word of God, forgiveness has been written into his word by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Jesus says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. He says, I will take your sin and part as far as the east as the west. I will remember it against you no more. He says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our sin. So let me show you three quick observations about sovereign repentance. Number one, Throughout the Bible, repentance has this idea of that you're turning from your sin. Now, repentance is more than just simply turning from your sin. Listen to me. It is also the process of developing strength in that area of weakness so that you don't ever do it again. Listen to me. The idea of biblical repentance in Scripture is not just turning. It's not just acknowledging but it is developing the pattern of strength. It is the guards that you put up so that you don't ever commit that sin again. And the only way that happens is there has to be a spirit of humility and brokenness before the Lord. There is no such thing as true, genuine repentance without humility and without brokenness. Let me show you something. Take, take your Bible, for keep it, keep it here, and then turn, if you will, over to 2 Corinthians in chapter 7. I, I, I love this particular past scripture. You may recall that in the sixth chapter of this book, there is this in hideous situation that's actually going on in the church at Corinth. And so Paul writes them. He, he has, Paul's a little upset because they're allowing this thing to go on because they're not dealing with it. And so he writes them this very, very strong letter and I want you to listen to what he says. Look at verses 8 and 9. Listen to what he says in chapter 7. He says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though. I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief. I want you to understand that, that little phrase there. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Listen to verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For, see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourself innocent in this matter. You see, what, what Paul is reminding us is, is that sorrow produces this genuine repentance in your life. And so the question is, that we always have to ask ourselves, are we truly sorrowful for the sin that we committed, for how we behaved, for how we treated somebody else? One of the things I learned in my early years as a dad is that when my kids would mess up and they would come and tell Diane or tell me that, they had messed up and they say they're sorry. I learned a long time. I, learned, I had to learn this the hard way. But rather than just saying, okay, you're, you're forgiven, it's all right. I, I discovered, and this is something that young parents, I think, need to heed today, is I didn't withhold the forgiveness, but I asked some questions. If Sarah had done something, I would look at her and I said, sweetheart, I said, you tell me that you're sorry. Jared, you tell me that you're sorry. But how do you really feel about being sorrowful? Explain to me why you're sorry for what you did. How is this going to make you better? What are you going to do to make sure that you don't do this again? What are the things that you're going to do different? What I'm saying, listen to me, apology is not necessarily repentance. Just simply saying the word I'm sorry doesn't necessarily mean that you have a broken, contrite heart. And what David is talking about here is that true Biblical, genuine repentance always has at the heart and the core of it a spirit of humility and brokenness before the Lord. Secondly, though, is that the mark of true repentance is absence of self-defense. In other words, you don't put the wall up and try to blame it on somebody else. You don't pass the buck to somebody else. Well, I did this because of. True biblical repentance removes the other person, the other issue, the contributing factors. And let me just say this to you. If there is an if and a but in the confession, it's a verbal eraser. 
he gone. It erases sincerity. You find that throughout Scripture, when you truly begin to dig into this, that when someone sinned, when somebody did something wrong, and they truly wanted to be right with God, it's, it's just that person, that issue, and they fully embrace and fully take ownership of their sin. Thirdly, it's hard to get the help we need when we keep denying the reality of our condition. Well, my critical spirit is not that bad. Or somebody might say, my selfishness and greed, it's, it's, it's not all that bad. There's always something that's always worse that we can look at and say, well, you know, they did something worse than I did. And it's amazing. If, if, think about this. What if David had looked at Nathan when Nathan came in and said, how dare you tell me, the king, how to live? Who do you think you are getting into my business? What do you mean telling me that I am the man? I mean, you know the hell that Saul raised. I mean, in comparison, this isn't all that bad. What do you do with your sin? You've got to look at it and see it for what it is. And secondly, you've got to look to the Savior. I want you to turn over to Psalms 80 with me. And in Psalms chapter 80, David once again is just reminding us, this is the psalm of Asaph, and he's talking about the sins of the nation of Israel. And even though he's talking about the sins of the nation of Israel, this psalm has incredible application. And there are four quick things I want to give you. And he says three times in verses 3, verse 7, and verse 19, O Lord of hosts, restore us, cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Just in those four little simple truths gives us why we need to run to the Savior. Number one, he says, you've got to look to God for his attention. Listen to what he says, if you will. Just drop down in verses 14 and 15. Listen to what he says. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son who made strong your self. Listen to me. I, I said this the other day. You, you, as a Christian now that we're saved, I, I can't sin and enjoy it anymore. And if you're a believer and you can sin and enjoy it, something's wrong, okay? Probably have a real big question mark when it comes to your walk in faith with God. Because as a believer, the Spirit of God lives inside of us. And there is this sense of where... When I sin, one of the things I need is that attention of God. It's almost like when I sin and I break the fellowship that I have with God, it's almost like I feel like God's not even looking at me. Now, God doesn't change. God always loves us and always will love us. But I'm talking about inwardly. It's like if I, if I hurt Diane, I, it's almost like I just I don't look at her because I know I hurt her. Same thing is true when we sin against God, if we're truly saved and born again. It's like, man, I, I broke your heart. I disappointed you. And so what we desire is that we really desire, God, please, please, don't turn your face from me. I need your attention. But secondly, you've got to look to him for restoration. Now, in verse 3, he says, restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. In other words, what David was writing and what Asaph is writing when it turns to the nation is that, God, we... I, I need to be put back together again. I feel like that I'm broken and I'm cracked and I, I feel like there are pieces that are falling off and God, I need you to restore and I need you to put me back together again. And, and family, listen to me. That's what all of us wants to be because when we're not where we need to be or should be as a believer, then we feel like I, I can't be used. And that's where these individuals were this week. They said, Pastor, I listened to your sermon last week and I realized I want to get back in the game, but I don't feel worthy. Well, why don't I feel worthy? Well, have you confessed the sin? Some said, well, I probably hadn't really confessed it. And I really need to deal with it. You can't ignore it. You've got to call it what it is. God, restore me. Thirdly, we have to seek him for his pleasure. Again, verse 3, listen to this. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine. And I love that phrase, that we may be saved. God, I want you to be pleased with my thought life. God, I want you to be pleased with my actions. God, I want you to please the way that I love and treat Diane. I want you to be pleased the way that I respond to the body. I want you to be pleased with what goes on when I'm all by myself and nobody's around. God, I want you to be pleased. And then fourthly, you've got to look to him for deliverance. 
Can I tell you, I, I really and truly believe that the whole point of restoration, this whole point of making sure that we have the face of God and that we feel and sense his presence is that we might be saved. Now, most of the time we think of the word saved, we think of certainly being rescued or delivered. But let me also tell you what it means. It means to be put in a safe place. I want to challenge you to do something today. If it's been a long time since you have read Psalms 51, go home this afternoon, find a quiet place, and just read Psalms 51, and notice what David prays for. David prays, God, renew, restore. God, don't take your spirit from me. And what David was actually saying is, God, I want you to put me in a safe place. I acknowledge the sin. I call it what it is. I don't want to be put over here where I don't feel your presence and I don't sense your presence and I'm not able to be used for the glory of God. God, I, I, I want to be in a safe place because I don't want to ever do this or commit this or behave this way anymore. Can I just tell you more than anything else, God wants you in a safe place. That you don't have to be overcome by the giants in your life, the addictions in your life, the sin in your life, the stuff in your life that may plague you. And I will tell you that the keeping power is not in you and it's not in me, it's only in God. And when you run and when you look to the Savior, listen to me, he has everything that you need. It probably could be argued, literally, that the whole of the Christian life is about overcoming sin. Now, why is that? Because as long as we're on this earth, we're going to have sin in our life. We're going to have struggles. We're going to have battles. There's going to be giants who are going to raise up their ugly heads within us. And it's, it's, that's just the pathway that we're on until we get a glorified body. You don't have to live in guilt. He took care of that. If we have done what we're supposed to, if we have truly confessed, we've acknowledged it, we call it what it is, we take ownership. I blew it. And you know what I've always found? That when I come in genuine, honest brokenness, with a sincere heart, he cleanses, he forgives. It's covered under the blood of Christ. And I don't have to live in that guilt. And the only reason why Satan wants to try to hold out your dirty is to cause you to fail and stay out of being active and engaged and walking in truth. Don't listen to his lies. Because if you are forgiven and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb of God, I got news for you. You can stand toe to toe and nose to nose with the devil. And I got news for you. He does not win. Amen? But remember who you are in Christ. Forgiven. Cleansed. Whole. Live like it. Would you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I come to you this morning. Thank you for truth. Thank you, Father, for how that your word is here to set us free. But you set us free, again, not just simply to sit and do nothing, but to take this life and talents and abilities that we talked about last week and to use it for your kingdom. And maybe there are those here today that feel like, I just don't feel like I'm worthy. Maybe because of my past life. Maybe because of things that's happened. God set us free. Set us free to say, God, here am I, use me. Help me to walk in your truth. That I set forth those parameters that I'm walking with you daily and consistently and habitually that keeps me from committing those same old sins again and again and again. 
Lord, there is a world and a community that needs Jesus. And they need to see people. We're not perfect. We fail, we stumble, we make bad choices, but we are a people that have learned to run to the Savior. And he forgives and he cleanses. And he makes us whole again. So, Father, somebody struggling here today because of past sin and guilt, set them free to be used for your glory. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.